one. So, so you might be wondering why we have yet another talk on microservices. Right? So we've been having a tutorials and a bunch of talks on microservices. But actually, this is a continuation um, of Kasun's talk. Um, so Kasun basically talks about the microservices architecture at a high level in detail. Right, so this is basically my plan is to explain the WSU's answer to the microservices buzzword these days. So we've been building a microservices framework like um, Java. So you can basically uh, build microservices. So before going into this framework, I'd like to just uh, start with this diagram. I think you might have seen this diagram a uh, couple of times during this conference. So this nicely explains like the microservices, the inner architecture, which focuses on building microservices, like code level, you build a bunch of microservices, and then the outer layer explains the management, monitoring, um, like discovery, all that. Because it actually Kasun explained, um, when you take a monolithic application, you de decompose that application into a bunch of uh, units or microservices, and then uh, you may hit a different set of problems, like how do you do service discovery? How do you handle um, routing? How do you monitor? So now the de DevOps jobs is going to become complex. Earlier, they had only one jar file, one wo wo file maybe. Now, different, different microservices, different deployable uh, artifacts and all that. So, so in this talk, my primary focus is on the inner architecture, basically how you build microservices, basically uh, using uh, WSU solution, right? So this talk is basically organized uh, at the initial stage. I'm going to explain the features, performance comparisons of MSF4J. Later, I'll take you through a nine different uh, samples, actually a single sample, but I'm building the sample uh, in a step-by-step -step manner with nine steps. So let's see whether I will be able to do that because we have the limit of time. Yeah, so if you're interested in uh, checking out what's, what are we doing, like all that, you can basically go check out this, uh, our uh, GitHub project. There you will find all the code, code examples, um, uh, many different samples, explaining all the features in microservices and all that. So this is for your knowledge. So, so there are a bunch of microservices frameworks available for Java, like uh, Spring, Drop Pizard, and you might be wondering why we try to build another framework, right? So, so uh, these different, different frameworks, they have different strengths and weaknesses. WSO2, but we are trying to build something lightweight and very fast. That's our main objective. So whatever the feature that we're going to introduce, we have to make sure that we maintain the lightweightness and the performance comparison and all that. So at the beginning, we basically took a concise decision not to bloat this framework with different, different features. For example, let's say, if you want to connect databases um, and many other different, uh, we don't have many different connectors and all that. It's just, we provide just a framework and it's up to you to extend and use it. So that's the idea. And, and also, to make it, make your developer development life easier, we basically introduce or basically reuse JAXRS annotations. So I think most of you are familiar with JAXRS annotations. So we leverage that those features from Java. And also, um, we provide easy and simple way to de deploy, develop microservices. I will demonstrate that at the later stages. And also, these are some, some features like metrics, analytics, support uh, that comes from uh, the DAS. So if I go back to the previous diagram, even though in this talk, I'm going to talk about microservices framework. But in WSO2, we have most of the bits and pieces. And using those bits and pieces, 
you can implement the outer architecture as well. But unfo unfortunately, with the time, I won't be able to uh, talk about those uh, components. Yep. So some information about the microservices implementation. It's based on the new carbon kernel that is still working on that, and we are building all our products based on this carbon kernel. And the transport is based on Netty. Uh, at the moment, the pack size is 5 MB, and it start with 300 milliseconds. And we just, the framework just need 25 MB memory footprint. So, so this is how we're trying to basically uh, keep it lightweight and high performance. So now I'll talk about the performance comparison. So we, we basically looked at different, different microservices implementations, all Java-based, right? So this diagram shows the throughput versus concurrency. So we kept on increasing concurrency, and we monitor how these different, different implementations um, uh, handle through, throughput, I mean, the result of the values. So you can see so different, different implementations, uh, and they came up with result, the, the throughput values different. So if you want to try out these test cases yourself, um, all the code and the test suits are available in our GitHub repo, and all the instructions are there, so you can just try out yourself and verify these details. So the next diagram, basically we have monitored the memory growth when you kept on increasing the concurrency and how these individual different, different uh, frameworks behave. So you can also refer this diagram and all these diagrams are available in the documentation available in the GitHub project. I'm not gonna talk about these data. You can see the uh, differences. So core features of microservices framework. So we want you to quick, we want you to build solutions, microservices easily. And uh, like you can bootstrap a project and then quickly uh, deploy your samples, microservices, and maybe uh, deploy with Docker, Kubernetes, and all that. So we have included samples on them. And then the interesting feature would be a custom interceptor model, because since uh, you have a bunch of microservices, and you may have to do certain filtering, security, uh, extracting uh, metrics from the request or responses, right? So in order to do that, we have introduced a concept called interceptors. These interceptors can intercept basically the request and the response messages. So you can extract your any data, you can uh, enforce security and all these things. So it's using interceptors, you can extend the behavior. So one such extension would be the security. So by default, we provide OAuth-based security. Um, so the access tokens uh, will be validated against the identity server or a key server. And this uh, functionality is implemented as an interceptor. And again, the metrics gathering. So metrics will be extracted from all the requests and responses with an uh, interceptor. And uh, you can basically publish these metrics to our dash, log file, system out, or anywhere you want. And then the other feature would be the streaming input and streaming output support. This is like if you are building image or file servers, like you're dealing with large files and images, you can basically con uh, utilize this streaming feature where we, we are not going to load the complete message into the memory. Rather than you can stream it to the file, uh, you, you read chunk by chunk and read it to the file, like that. So those are APIs are also available in the microservices framework. And also we do have the tooling support with our Dev Studio. It's like code first or contract first. Either you can write your Microsoft Java class with annotations and then generate the Swagger, Swagger definition. Or else if you have a Swagger definition, you can import it to Dev Service, uh, WSO to Dev Studio, and get the Java code. So vice versa. And the other thing is like we, have tried to uh, implement 
comprehensive set of samples uh, demonstrating all the features that we have. So uh, when you try to, when you, are, when you start implementing your microservices, you can uh, refer these samples. Yep. So the primary focus of this talk is to like, show you how you develop microservices using MSFJ. So in order to achieve that, I have designed a uh, nine-step sample. So we will be building a single sa sample uh, using these steps. So first, my plan is to show you how to create a microservice project initially. So I'm building a Maven project and open it using IDEA or Eclipse. And then let's simply implement the GET operation, see what, the, what are the APIs look like, how you develop, just to give you a feeling of Microsoft MSFJ framework. And then add, add pet operation. Uh, then we'll be completing, the show, I'll show you complete the microservice with all the metrics integrated. To show you how you, get, how you can gather metrics. This, this sample is about a pet store where uh, I'm, I only focus on the pet service. So that bunch of operations for you to, uh, let's say uh, you can add pets, remove pets. So it's a part of an e-commerce application, let's say called pet store. It's one single microservice. And then uh, we look at the exception mapper support that is available from the JAXRS. Basically, you can return uh, custom exceptions uh, from your code. Then Swagger, like say you, you started with your Java code and how you generate Swagger definition, basically for governance and publishing APIs. And then how you secure your API. We can do a demo. Then the last two demos, my plan is show you how you run a WSO2 microservices, or the uh, service developed using MSFJ, using Docker. And then you will show you how to create a Docker file, a Docker image, and then the Docker container. Then the next uh, next sample, my plan is to show you how to manage this Docker, your microservices, like scaling, uh, scale down, scale up, using microservices, and then uh, routing, uh, discovery aspects that uh, Kasun explains in the morning. Right. So let's start with the first sample. Can you guys see the code? Yeah, it's okay, right? Yeah, so because of limited time, I have prepared all the uh, commands that I'm gonna use during all the samples so then I can just copy and paste without wasting, without typing, and even if I forget, I can just uh, copy and paste, right? So if you are like Maven, if I, get, if I use to Maven, uh, you can basically use our Maven archetype. I will show you like, right? This is a sample Maven archetype that we have developed as part of the microservices project. So first, uh, all the documentation is available. I will explain like, you, you first need to provide the, uh, the group ID, uh, the artifact ID, and the version, and your package structure, the base package of the project, right? Then um, maybe, the class name. This is the class name. And if you, this will take a bit of one or two minutes, and it will basically try to generate uh, a project. So this project basically create the Maven build artifact, uh, sample microservices classes, uh, and you can easily run this on the generated uh, sample then and there. Then you can start your uh, implementation on top of this sample. It usually take one or two minutes to generate. Yeah. 
So once this is generated, you can use Maven commands to build, uh, like Maven clean install. And also, if you want to open up this project using uh, uh, IntelliJ IDEA or Eclipse, you can use uh, Yeah, anyway, uh, so I have this step one generated. So all the steps, step zero one. And if I open this, like you can Maven, if you type Maven idea idea, it will create a uh, ID project, and you can open, yeah, get used to the idea project. You can't see, yes. So as you can see, this project structure is generated. I'll just uh, change the font size. Yeah. So you can see uh, it generates a Maven from POM file that you can start with. And it, uh, it says this is your main class. And if I look, go into the source code, normal Ma Ma Java uh, Maven package structure. And this is the entry point. This is basically the main method. I think, can you see? Right. Yeah, so this is the main method of, uh, this is the programming model that we have introduced. Uh, you can have a class with the main method, and inside the main method, uh, you can do something like uh, microservices runner, that's our API, dot. You can give your microservices implementation any class which has any object which has uh, JAXRS annotations, right? Likewise, you can dip, if you have multiple things, you can deploy one by one, multiple services in a single package, and then um, you can start. So this will start the microservice by default in 80, uh, 80 port, but you can configure that if you want via a YAML file. Right. So if I quickly go through the, the generated uh, microservice, generated JAXRS service, right? so you have basically the uh, operations for HTTP verbs, get, put, post, delete. Right? So this is just a sample. I will uh, move on to the second uh, sample. That is, we can, how we can, I will show you how we can implement the get operation. Right? So let me close this. So here, yeah. So we have only the get method implemented here. So this is just uh, very looks very similar to JAXRS. Right? So you have get, and uh, it accepts a parameter called string ID, path parameter. And then it returns a response. This is uh, a JAXRS API. You can pass a response. So here, what I'm going to do is I have used like a, a dummy storage called pet store utils, and you can pass the ID, it will give me a pet object. So if I just quickly go through this, I have add a static pet object for the demonstration purposes, and this will uh, check the map and return the storage. So I have used like, a, right? So here, what, what this means is get pet if, if if there is a pet, uh, I'm going to return status OK, that is um, HTTP, HTTP status code, and the pet object. And if there is no pet, <coughs> I'm going to return uh, the not found HTTP status code. Right? So this is the model. So let me quickly run this. You can't see this, so 
uh, it says uh, started on port 8080 and in 300-odd milliseconds. So let me quickly use a curl command as a client just to invoke this localhost 8080. So the path would be, if you had checked the pet service, the root path is pet, right? So it should be, uh, the HTTP verb should be get slash path, and I have to pass an ID. So in my, I have a dummy ID here called pet001. Let me just copy that and put. Sorry? Sorry. It should be pet. Yeah, here you go. So you get a JSON. So let me quickly uh, copy this JSON uh, somewhere here. So this is the output you got, right? So because here we have produces JSON, right? So you, if you want, you can change this to different uh, output type, different message type. So this is sample. This is very simple. So let me move on to the, uh, let's look at how you can implement a post operation or a put operation, right? So I'll quickly open the sample uh, step three. Open the idea project. Yeah. So if I look at the the pet service, now I can see the uh, the post operation. Add pet. It's very similar. Product. This now now this this method accepts a pet. So it uh, uh, consumes an application JSON object and then it's mapped to the pet like by the framework. And we, I first check whether uh, there's a, already a pet with the same ID available in my store. Very simple logic. And then if, if yes, I basically send a response with the conflicts, I think 409, right? Pet, pet with same ID exists. Or else I add it and send a OK response. So let's quickly uh, test this. So I have the command to test. Yeah, so here I'm passing the JSON string and the content type application JSON and just the pet and the HTTP verb is post. Sorry. I need to start the application. Yeah, it started. So I got a 200 now. If I try to basically get it, use the curl get. Same endpoint. Pet 002, I'm getting. Now if I try to post, let's say, just to show the data handling part, oh, the same one, I should get a 409 conflict, in the restful way of handling the conflicts and all that. Right, so this is just the uh, post. The put is the same. Put means you're like doing an update, right, in the restful world. Um, so let's look at the, the fourth sample uh, quickly that, that uh, you can see the complete implementation. So you can see the, uh, the put method implemented, same manner, same code, and the delete, right? So if you look at this slide deck, the fourth sample, my objective was to like uh, complete the pet sample with metrics. So this will I quickly show you how you can gather matrices. Right? So for that, there are various uh, annotations that you can use. So we have, in WC2, metrics framework have introduced a bunch of 
uh, annotations like this is called at timed. So you get you get the uh, uh, the uh, request count, average, uh, minimum, maximum, response time, request time, all that, some information. So if you put the timed and there are other annotations that you can push to HTTP and you can just get the count and all that. So if you go to the, our documentation, you can find various annotations, right? So, and also if you look at this, um, the application, the main method, you can see I have, I have added an interceptor here. So this is how you add an interceptor to intercept requests and responses. Um, I think if I can show you a sample interceptor, the API, the API is something like that. You have a method called pre-call and post-call. Uh, you can intercept request and you can intercept responses. That's simple. Uh, so if you add this metrics interceptor and pass some parameters, you can collect uh, metrics. So here, the, what I'm trying to do is, when I init, I pass two uh, properties like metrics reporter console. So report metrics to the console, they're running. Right? And also re report JMX. If you connect JMX, you can see. Likewise, there are like some other types, J DAS. If you have a DAS server running, you can uh, pass matrix to dash and build dashboards and all that. But I'm not going to show that for the limited time. So let me quickly run this. And the other thing, I have set a system property here. Report statistics in a 15 seconds interval to the screen and also to the JMS. So it will report statistics in every 15 seconds. You can change that. Right, so let me quickly, uh, yeah, it's, so even though I haven't uh, not sure whether you can. I, these are like all the JVM level statistics you get. But since I haven't invoked any services, I don't have any service level statistics. So let me quickly uh, invoke. Let's say get. And also a post. Yeah. So let's see. Fortunately, I can't. I don't know how to increase. Uh, but I will copy and paste it and show you the output. Yeah. So here you should get. <coughs> we'll open a file, text file. Yeah. So here, these are all the JMA 11 statistics. If you're interested, you can uh, build. Uh, so the other ones are like from the annotation, the time, the annotation you put. This is for the ad pet. You can see the number of requests, uh, different different statistics, and the other one, get paid, and the same sort of thing. So these are like, uh, since I have used just the timed, uh, you're getting basic set of annotations, but you can uh, improve that also. Mm, I'll quickly move to the next exception mapper. So let's see, uh, in, my, in, uh, in all these samples, we've been basically, if there are exceptions, we've been all sending this. We, we didn't throw exceptions or anything, right? So let's see how you can throw your custom exceptions and then convert those custom ex exceptions uh, to meaningful messages to the client, right? So for that, Jaxar is, you have something called um, exception mappers. So let me quickly open project. Step, I think it should be step five. quickly show you uh, the, what, what differences it makes to the fetch throw method. <laughs> yeah, so if you look at this uh, add pet operation, so you can see earlier I had if inside the if condition, I just send the response message. Now I'm basically throwing my own custom ex exception, right? And so this exception, uh, in the XRS world, you, for this exception, you have to write a, a mapper that is called exception mapper. Let's say duplicate pet mapper. Here you define the output. You define if you get an exception of duplicate pet, how you handle it. So in your code, every places you can just 
uh, send uh, these exceptions, and you can handle, you can uh, uh, basically configure how to pass these messages to customer or your client, like here, like here, media type text plane. I'm passing a simple error message with the HTTP status code conflict. So I don't now I don't have to do this each, each and every place. I can simply use uh, this duplicate pet exception, right? So and also pet not found exception. Like this is like uh, making your code look better, right? So, so I'll quickly move on to the next. Swagger support. So Swagger, it's like this. Uh, should be six. If I go to uh, my pet service, I have added some uh, anno Swagger annotations here. So you can see Swagger definition. This is like you describe your API, the high level, uh, basically. Uh, who the developer is, what licenses, and some title description and all that. Then each method level, you can define your operation, responses, and all that. This is like typical Swagger annotations, right? And you, and you can start this application, and then we'll see how you can get the Swagger. Um, so if you go to browser, uh, let's say HTTP, uh, localhost, uh, this is Swagger. You can give path. So your path, you are interested in path pet, right? Slash pet. If you enter this, you will get, so I'll copy and paste to the IDE. And basically put it like JSON. So you can see your Swagger definition now with all the details that you put it. So this is like a, uh, what I did was a code first approach. I write the service and get a uh, Swagger definition. Now we, you can share this Swagger with someone else and ask him to invoke. And also you can, if you if you know how to write Swagger or if you tools, you can write the Swagger and import this to our Dev Studio. It will generate the code, skeleton. Right. So that's all. Simple. Now the next sample would be security. So, so for that, I have a, a slide which explains the concept. So the, this way, what I'm going to do is, now client has to basically talk to an identity server and get an access token, OAuth token, right? And now he can pass the access token to the microservice. So there is an interceptor waiting, and it will basically get, extract the token and again talk to the identity server to validate the signature and all that, right? And then if the token is valid, it will let you in. So th this is the idea. Uh, uh, sh I'll quickly show you how you can uh, do this. Yeah. So in order to do that, so one thing, you need to basically add this interceptor. So this is like OAuth security interceptor. This will basically intercept messages and enforce security. Likewise, if you have your custom security mechanism, you can implement this and you can do it. So it's so that simple. Uh, if I start this, I have a I have a run I have an identity server already started in my machine, and if I go to the identity server UI, like quickly I'll show you that uh, I have a OAuth application created. So if you service providers, this is like, and then inbound authentication OAuth two, so I have a OAuth application created, and now I have a uh, sample, um, which basically this, if you run this, you will get a new access token from your identity server. This is the client side. Uh, so you go to the client side, if you are the client, uh, you basically invoke this, you get an access token, right? And then you can use this access token to invoke and 
with the new access token. Sorry. And you can copy paste this access token uh, and update this. If you change it, you will see a different result. Yeah. So the next sample would be um, run a Docker image of pet service, right? So we'll quickly do this as well. We are running. I'm running out of time. Sorry for that. Uh, if you go to step eight uh, and the You open this project, you will see uh, a Docker file. So this this is sample Docker file, and it, it explains. Uh, it basically creates a Docker image with our uh, pet store jar, and then uh, when you run it, it, it it runs the jar and exposes the service via port 8080. So uh, can quickly run this. Right, Docker build. Or give a name, let's say, give a version, and dot. Let's build a Docker image. So if you go to Docker images, you would see the new Docker image that I created. And then this Docker image is just a VM, like it's an image. And you can run a Docker, inst Docker container. That's your, right? So you can do that. Um, uh, Docker run, and you have to do a port mapping. I'll quickly show why, because I'm running everything in Mac, so Mac uh, you, it doesn't support uh, Docker, right? So I have a VM here, and then from Mac I invoke Docker commands using the Docker machine. Therefore, I have to do a port mapping. So this guy, my microservice, exposed port 8080, but because it's inside VM. From Mac, I can't access, so I had to do port mapping. So this level, so this Docker, there's a command to do port mapping. You can, if you enter, like, it will basically somehow map map it, and I, I can access the service via 8080. And then uh, I went to a daemon mode and the image. Right, one zero. Sorry, pet service. It's Sorry, but let me name change. It's pet server. Anyway. So now if you look at Docker PS, which lists all the containers, and now have container ID. So if you want to see like logs, you can put uh, logs and the Docker container. And if you, this is logs coming from your Docker container and microservice started. And if you want to access, now, so based on this diagram, I explained that there's VM running. So I need to, I can't directly access the container, so I had to go by VM. So the VM. If I, I am getting the VM IP like this, so you'll give me the VM IP, and let's quickly do a curl. Uh, get. Um, yeah, so this is like Docker. And the final thing, it take two minutes, Show you the the Kubernetes sample, um, right? So, so I'm not going to explain what Kubernetes means. And uh, Docker is basically contain uh, manage the life cycle. You can start, stop Docker, create Docker. Kubernetes is basically orchestration and manage all the Docker images. You can scale up, scale down. It does uh, routing, load balancing, and all that. So, uh, Kubernetes there are a bunch of concept pod services replications. Uh, I'm not going to have some time. So this, I have the same problem since I'm running on Mac. I have Mac OS, and I, but I have started 
Kubernetes master and uh, minion, one node using Vagrant. And then inside the minion, I'm going to run my microservice. So now, using the same mechanism, I can access uh, the microservice. I'll quickly show you that. Last step. Yeah, so here I have uh, so same, I'm using the same Docker image, and I'm going to, I have written two uh, Kubernetes YAML my files. One file is to start up a, a, a R controller. Like, so I don't have time to explain. The, this is a replication controller. And then the Kubernetes service. So, I'll, if, so how to do is this? If you go to the uh, Kubernetes, you can say the command line tool is called kubectl. Um, you can actually, you can use create minus f dot, because it will use the files in this directory. Yeah, so it, uh, one replication control is created, one. So if I use Kubernetes uh, a, a c command line con commands to like show you like uh, the replication, let's say get replication controllers, one get service, get pods, one services, all there. So now if I want to, this is, the actual microservice, it's pod means. So I can basically scale now. Um, let's say the demanded high, uh, like uh, scale, RC, uh, the name of the uh, replication controller. This is a replication controller. Uh, and replicas equal, let's say, five. Not sure. Either. Yeah, now if you say kubectl um, get pods, you would see five different microservices running. So each and every uh, guy here is a container running in this uh, in this minion node. So I can basically quickly uh, go to my minion node like using Vagrant, uh, show you that it's actually running. Vagrant SSH node one. This is, I'm going to the minion node. Yeah, so I'm inside my VM, and you can say Docker PS. It will show you all the other Kubernetes system services with my Fetso containers. You can see a bunch of containers there. Right? So this is uh, like starting from the project, how you orchestrate, how you develop a microservice application, and moving it to production. So this sample.